Καλησπέρα κυρίες και κύριοι, σας καλωσορίζουμε σε άλλο ένα επεισόδιο της σειράς μας θέματα υγείας. Απόψε έχω ένα καλεσμένο ορθοπαιδικό και όπως σας είχα πριν πριν λίγο καιρό θα κάνουμε μια σειρά εκπομπών με διάφορα ορθοπαιδικά προβλήματα και απόψε θα μιλήσουμε με τον καλεσμένο μας για τις παθήσεις του ώμου που είναι πολύ συχνές. So tonight we welcome Mr. Livio Dimasio. Fantastic. Thank you for coming here and welcome. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to have yourself and many other colleagues from the clinic you come from. And it's very nice having you here to discuss about orthopedic problems, which are very common. So Mr. Livio Dimascio is a consultant orthopedic uh, doctor at Royal London Hospital and also one of the distinguished doctors of London Sports Orthopedics. It's a private clinic. He's a specialist in upper limb surgery, mainly shoulder, elbow and hand as well. So tonight you will give us all your special knowledge about the shoulders. That's right, Kiki. And maybe you will answer some questions we have. I'll try to. And that's very nice. And I have a lot of patients with problems in their shoulders, young patients, sure. a lot of cleaners in the area where I work okay. in Bayswater yeah, yeah. and they complain. So I w you will start explaining to us what is useful as information for the viewers and then I will ask you some questions when I don't understand something or if I guess some questions would come from viewers yeah. and so on. Okay. Wonderful. So um, the shoulder mm. is thought to be a very complicated joint mm -hmm. um, and as you say a lot of people get pain in the shoulder and it can be sometimes a little difficult to ascertain where that pain is coming from um, and if we're able to identify the source of the pain and, and correct the problem then we yeah. can improve people. Mm -hmm. um, now the shoulder joint everybody thinks is a ball and socket and actually it's not a ball and socket alone it's also a joint between the scapula and the chest wall. So when you move your shoulder, mm -hmm. there is movement that happens between the ball and socket, but also the scapula and the chest wall. So looking at this first illustration, mm -hmm. the shoulder girdle is made up of a collarbone, which is um, connecting the shoulder girdle to the chest, the scapula and also the humerus that articulates with the glenoid. So in the second illustration, you can see that when you move your arm and lift it up, half of the movement really happens at the ball and socket and half of the movement happens at the scapula. The thing that actually makes joints move are muscles and mm -hmm. these muscles are divided into two groups. Okay. And everybody's heard of these mystical and magical rotator cuff muscles, but these are actually four muscles that arise from the scapula and attach to the top end of the humerus. So looking at the third illustration, mm -hmm. we can see that these four muscles radiate from the scapula and attach to the humerus, and they're hugely important in movement and initiation of movement in the shoulder and also stability of the shoulder. So when we get problems with either the joint or problems with these muscles, then unfortunately you either develop pain or dysfunction in your shoulder. And it can be really, really very disabling because you need your shoulder to move your hand in space so that you yeah. can function with the daily activities. And quite often, shoulder pain can keep you awake at night. And as you know, yeah. not getting sleep makes life miserable. I know, I recently I found out <laughs> from personal experience. Yes. Th that's why obviously we get, first of all, we don't localize the pain in the joint, we feel the pain in the muscle. And maybe that's why that's the first symptom Absolutely. Often people describe pain mm. that isn't in the shoulder itself. And a very common thing that I see with my patients is mm. they will present with pain that tends to radiate down the lateral mm. aspect of the arm. And actually the problem is in the shoulder or not actually in the shoulder joint, perhaps in the tendons or the bursa above the shoulder. So a very, very common condition that I'll see in young and middle-aged individuals mm -hmm. is when they develop inflammation of something called the bursa. Mm -hmm. Now the bursitis. bursa, absolutely bursitis, the bursa is a layer of tissue that is above the tendons mm -hmm. and it prevents the tendons, um, sorry, 
prepares attendance, uh, prevents attendance. So if we look at illustration six, uh -huh. it prevents the tendons from rubbing against the shoulder blade. Now, lots of injuries or even repetitive activities sometimes, mm -hmm. or even sometimes going to the gym and doing exercise, but in a poor controlled way, you can develop inflammation in this burst or even inflammation in these rotator cuff tendons. And people will present with pain over the lateral aspect of their arm. Mm -hmm. It's very unusual to, for pain to radiate anywhere beyond the elbow, but it can radiate down the arm and it can be worse with elevation of the arm and an, act, an activity. Mm -hmm. So lifting the arm to the side or in front of you can uh, be very painful and be created by inflammation in these tendons. If you lift a lot of weight, if you carry two, three bags which are heavy, yeah. will that cause a similar problem? Well, it can do. Um, <coughs> a, lot of, a lot of the young individuals that I see, the problem is due to primarily poor posture initially. Mm -hmm. So if you have poor posture in your shoulders, then that can have a knock-on effect with developing poor function in the rotator cuff and development of inflammation in these tendons. So carrying heavy bags and sitting at a mm -hmm. desk and then going to the gym in the evening and then trying to push weights, it can all have a knock-on effect and actually create inflammation or bursitis. All right. Are these reversible? Absolutely. So again, to identify the cause of the individual shoulder pain is hugely important. So by correcting posture initially mm -hmm. and uh, an appropriate program of physiotherapy is often the thing that will actually help somebody get better. Okay. But the appropriate physiotherapy. So quite often I hear people going, well, I go to the gym, I do exercises, mm -hmm. but it may be that very thing that has caused the problem and we need to control the position of the scapula so that the foundation of the shoulder is nice and strong and stable so that the rotator cuff can function appropriately. What about steroid injections? Would you uh, recommend them? Um, they are very, very useful in improving people's symptoms. And mm -hmm. sometimes it can be difficult to rehabilitate an individual shoulder if their shoulder is very painful. So the advantage of a corticosteroid injection is not necessarily first line treatment. The first line of treatment should be to help improve people's posture and exercise appropriately. And then if that doesn't work in itself, yes, a corticosteroid injection in the correct place is very useful because it helps with pain and allows you to retrain your shoulder mm -hmm. so that you reset the clock as it were. Okay. And how often can you do them? Is it three monthly, sooner, later, or it depends on the case? Well, it very much depends on the case. Mm -hmm. However, I'm a believer that um, there is an old wives' tale that says that I hear very often that you can only have three injections. Yes. Now, the, the truth of the matter, I quite like it because it makes the individual think, why am I having the injection? Mm -hmm. And it makes the clinician think, why am I giving the injection? Now, there is a correlation between giving lots of steroid injections and potentially making damage itself. So if you have had two or maybe three injections, then you've got to think, well, maybe we're not either treating the right thing or we might, must have a different strategy mm -hmm. in giving long-term relief. And sometimes that means surgery. Not always, but sometimes. Mm -hmm. Other therapeutic options which are not so invasive? Well, it depends on the condition. On the condition. It depends on the condition. But generally, the mainstay of treatment of a rotator cuff dysfunction mm -hmm. or bursitis would be an appropriate program of physiotherapy and maybe a steroid injection. Okay. okay? All right. And what about tendonitis, which is also very common? Are they related or independently they happen? Absolutely, it is absolutely related that quite often people will have inflammation in the bursa to begin with or a tendonitis and both. And then there is a progression of this um, that with time, potentially, you can develop small tears or even a complete tear mm -hmm. in the tendon. And if that were to happen, then potentially that's not something that you can treat with an injection. Mm. If you generally have a rotator cuff tear, then it's probably not a good idea to put or bathe the, the tendon in a, a steroid because that's not going to help it repair and it may actually weaken it further. Mm -hmm. Okay, So steroid injections are very helpful, 
but potentially not for steroid injection uh, for rotator cuff tears mm -hmm. and often it's very important to identify and make sure that there isn't a tear present before you put the steroid injection in correct do you usually do mris is it the most indicated um, investigation or would you do something else? Well, you can do an MRI scan. The advantage of an MRI scan, it gives lots of information. Mm -hmm. The disadvantage is that the patient has to go in the MRI scanner yeah. and that's not always the most... Uh, um, True, they're classic. ...the nicest probably. thing. Yeah. Um, there is ultrasound. Now, ultrasound is a fantastic way and a dynamic way of getting information about the rotator cuff. Um, it is very quick, it's very mm -hmm. easy, and it does give very good information about the tendons, but it doesn't give any detail about the bone or the joint. Mm -hmm. So that is its disadvantage. Mm -hmm. So um, when I see a patient, I usually will know what the diagnosis is when I'm examining the patient. And I use clinical tests mm -hmm. to confirm my suspicions. Right. So depending on what I'm feeling and what I find when I examine the patient, then I will decide what is the most appropriate investigation, whether it is maybe an x-ray sometimes, mm -hmm. maybe it is an MRI, maybe it's an ultrasound. All right. And what other uh, options do you have to treat? Is it mainly surgery in that case? If you have a, a tear of the rotator cuff? So a rotator cuff tear um, will look something like illustration 7. Mm -hmm. And what we see is that the tendon usually will separate from actually its attachment to the bone. Now, if that is a complete or full thickness tear of the tendon where it separates from the bone, unfortunately it is unlikely to heal itself because the muscle retracts the tendon away from the bone. So usually when somebody has a rotator cuff tear, which is a complete tear, then we would recommend surgery. Mm -hmm. Because without the tendon being attached, then not only do you have pain, and quite often you have night pain, but you have poor function of the shoulder. Because these muscles stabilize the shoulder and initiate motion. Mm -hmm. So if you have a full thickness tear in your tendon, then your movement is going to be pretty poor. And do you stitch it or is it something else also you proceed? No, absolutely. Um, well, historically, we used to do these operations as an open operation. Mm -hmm. Now, the operation is very similar that we do now, but we're able to do it keyhole. And the advantage of doing it keyhole is, well, cosmetically, perhaps it looks slightly better. No scars. But, well, smalls, there are always scars. Yes. Um, but they're small scars. But the advantage is that the infection rate is probably a lot mm -hmm. lower. And generally, patients can be a lot more comfortable afterwards. Mm -hmm. But with a big tear in a tendon, unfortunately, it can still be a slow recovery process because it involves quite a bit of time and therapy for the tendon to actually heal back onto the bone. So if you do a keyhole, you access the tendon from two, three sides, small incisions, and you try to stitch back. And then how, how, uh, how easy is that to be done? Do they have to stay too long in the hospital? Well, usually it can be, um, you know, most shoulder surgeries, um, to be honest, can be performed as day surgery. All right. Um, you come into hospital, you go home the same day. Very Generally, good. my patients have a general anaesthetic, but not always. It all is right. possible to do the operation with them awake sometimes if they wish. Even keyhole? Even keyhole surgery. Um, we're able to give people a regional block, um, mm -hmm. which means that we mm -hmm. uh, anaesthetize the nerves that supply the arm and the shoulder. Brachia. No, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, a brachial plexus or interscalene block. We, I usually will perform the surgery with both. So the idea okay. is that the patient doesn't really want to be awake for the procedure, but they have a very light anaesthetic, so when they wake up, they have no pain, which is usually, fa usually yeah. very, very effective. I suppose it's a bit scary also to have two, three troll cars get, getting in well, your Well, the shoulder. patient doesn't see much, to be oh, honest, okay. but quite often sitting still, because if it's a big tear, it might mm. take an hour, an hour and a half to, to repair, and to sit still for that length of time can be difficult. So, some, something difficult. So illustration eight shows you how the operation is sort of performed, mm -hmm. but we use small pores portals to actually instrument the shoulder and then there are many ways to, to repair the tendon. So in illustration 9 we use small what we call bone anchors to mm -hmm. actually reattach the tendon back to the bone with some very strong stitches okay. um, that is usually extremely effective. 
What kind of stitches are those? Just from my curiosity, are they what material do you well, use? Well, um, they're they're essentially a very fancy plastic. They're oh, okay. a, a polyethylene, um, but there are stitches that are lots of different designs, mm -hmm. and sometimes the, um, people you tend to use tapes. Where the idea is to sort of dissipate some of the force across where you've repaired the tendon, so that you are allowing the blood supply mm. not to be uh, interrupted, so that actually the body can heal. So it is a very common and very effective way of treating a rotator cuff tear. And like I said, unfortunately, they tend not to heal by themselves. Yeah, definitely. Is there any possibility after you repair to have another tear after well, surgery? Absolutely. Unfortunately, in life, nothing is 100%. Mm -hmm. So the success rate is high, but never okay. 100%. Generally speaking, the tears that do best with surgery are people who are young that have mm. had traumatic tears mm. where they have fallen over and they have um, injured or torn their tendon and they are generally ones that will do very well. Unfortunately, we're all getting old at the same rate True. and as we get older, the tendon, if it is degenerate and thin and mm. it's beginning to fail, then the chance of failure also is slightly increased when you repair the tendon. So sometimes it is not appropriate to repair the tendon. We can look at other options mm -hmm. um, depending on the patient's age and their function. One thing that has transformed, I think, shoulder surgery in the last 20 years is the development of something called a reverse geometry shoulder replacement. All right, I don't know about that. So we have a specialist to explain. Um, in illustration 14, mm -hmm. this is an example of somebody with shoulder arthritis. Bad one. And it is pretty bad. And they not only have a worn out joint, but the pattern of arthritis shows me that actually they have been living without a rotator cuff. They have developed a rotator cuff tear that has not been repaired. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, with time, because it's a large tear, they get um, some instability of the shoulder and poor function and they as a consequence of that develop arthritis. Mm -hmm. Now ordinarily the options here is they have painful shoulder and a tear in their tendon. To repair their tear wouldn't work mm -hmm. and in fact it wouldn't improve their pain because they've still got shoulder arthritis. So what we um, are able to do now in the right individual and they need to be of a certain age mm -hmm. that we consider a shoulder replacement. So this is not something we do in young individuals, of but course. perhaps um, in our uh, advancing years, then we can do a shoulder replacement. And this particular shoulder replacement, as you can see in illustration 15, is called a reverse geometry shoulder replacement. It's like a hip replacement. Sort of, it's but it's cleverer than a hip replacement. Is it? Yeah, because what we do is we change the mechanics of the shoulder. Mm -hmm. So the hip surgeons try and to replace a ball and socket and they keep the orientation and the mechanics similar. Mm -hmm. But what we've done in this setting is we've turned the ball and socket the other way around because of the fact that there is no ro functioning rotator cuff. So what we're doing is actually we're tricking other muscles to mm -hmm. do the work of the tendons that aren't there anymore. Amazing. And this is a fantastic way of improving somebody's pain, but very often actually restoring their function so that they have sometimes near normal shoulder function in the future. That's very interesting. Do you have dislocations of those? Because if somebody started doing rotations and flexions, abductions and adductions and a lot of movements because they think, I have a pretty new shoulder, do you have dislocations and problems? So, so there are always potential problems. Potential. Um, but instability is very rare. Mm. It does happen but it is very rare because of the fact that actually it is a phenomenally stable implant. Um, if you look at a more conventional shoulder replacement, mm -hmm. much like illustration 13, this is retaining the geometry of the shoulder so that there is a ball and socket orientated correctly. This potentially can dislocate as well mm. because this is more inherently unstable, much like the native shoulder. But again, the advantage of this shoulder replacement is that the tendons are functioning normally and we are retaining anatomy and 
it preserves options in the future because you've always got to think about plan B. Mm. And if that fails, what are you going to do? If it's a problem, you repeat the operation? Absolutely. Um, it is possible to repeat and revise um, any joint replacement, whether mm -hmm. it's a joint replacement at the base of your thumb or your hip. But unfortunately, the more complicated the operation means that the chance of there being a good outcome at the end is slightly less. 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 And how long does it take to, for your patients to recover after this operation? How long does it take to go back to a normal life, let's say? Well, um, it depends. Of course, but with, a, an average. with an anatomic shoulder replacement where we're preserving the function, usually my patients are pretty happy by three or four months. Okay. And um, for example, the patient, that I, the x ray that I showed you of that anatomic shoulder, he's playing tennis again with his shoulder. He seems pretty happy with it. That's amazing. Um, not everybody gets the same function. Of course. Of course. Um, and it obviously. obviously depends on um, the degree of damage to begin with. Um, with a reverse geometry shoulder replacement, the advantage to a degree is the fact that we're not relying on the tendons that mm -hmm. don't work anymore. And sometimes the recovery is sometimes a bit quicker because they've had such a terrible shoulder for such a long time mm -hmm. that they tend to rehabilitate quicker because they're using other muscles that there is nothing wrong with. That's very interesting. And even last time we had Ramon Tamasebi here, he was telling us you do all these um, kind of replacements of joints, even in hands, in fingers, Absolutely. metacarpal phalangeal. It's, um, it's so impressive that you can replace the joints, it's, all the joints. It is not always appropriate. Of course. Uh, you need to consider what the specific problem is for the specific patient and also what their functional demand is as well because sometimes a joint replacement is not the correct answer. Okay. Sometimes it's worth considering doing other types of operation for arthritis, mm -hmm. either trying to resurface it with a biological material or okay. tissue, or even fusing a joint. And sometimes paradoxically, not necessarily um, a, a knee or a hip, but actually fusing a joint paradoxically can improve function, particularly with um, young individuals mm -hmm. because the, uh, the, the advantage of that is that you will not need to do another operation in the future because the disadvantage of all these wonderful joint replacements that we're able to do is that they don't last forever. Right. So again, we've always got to think about plan B. Correct. And I will ask again, do you, ha do, you do these operations at NHS as well, or is it only privately? No, no, absolutely. My, my private practice mm -hmm. reflects my NHS practice. Okay. The disadvantage of the NHS, unfortunately, is that it takes time. Time. Waiting list. Absolutely. And privately, of course, you have the cost. Yes. Is it excessive? Do you want to give us an idea? Maybe we have viewers who would be interested. Or again, it varies according to the case. Well, needs, the amount patients. of money that you earn, I'm sure that you will be able to be treated by me privately. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's, that sounds promising, but you know, in general. All right, that, that's good to know that we have so many options because we are used to slings, steroid injections, some physiotherapy and limited there. The fact that you can replace the whole joint and somebody can play tennis after that is beyond imagination sometimes. A few years back, when we were medical students, we wouldn't know these things. Of course. Um, the, the most common things that I will see, however, are not necessarily requiring joint replacement. Mm -hmm. um, that is something for advanced arthritis for individuals that uh, you know, are older than you and I, perhaps. Yeah. But the things that I will commonly see are bursitis and tendon yeah. problems, and also this uh, condition known as frozen shoulder. Mm -hmm. Now, frozen shoulder is an interesting condition. The most common, especially for a GP. Ask me how many I see. Well, a lot of the time <laughs> that people get diagnosed and labelled with a frozen shoulder, and mm. it is not necessarily a frozen shoulder. Correct. People often will say, well, I have a frozen shoulder because I have pain and I have poor function. But frozen shoulder is a really very specific condition. Mm -hmm. It is an inflammatory condition in joint, uh, involving the joint lining. Um, and we don't know why it happens most of the time. There are associations with diabetes, with trauma, with mm -hmm. hypothyroidism, with neck problems. 
but often the leading cause of developing a frozen shoulder is idiopathic, which means we've got no idea, even in 2016. So this is an inflammatory condition involving the lining of the joint, not the tendons, not anything else other than the capsule of the joint, hence its name, adhesive capsulitis. And in illustration number four, sort of shows what the problem is. It's very angry and people will have difficulty with sleeping and they'll have poor function, but often it follows a sequence of events, as in illustration five, where they get pain to begin with, they can get terrible pain. They can be wandering around the house at night, looking at the ceiling, thinking, how can I get sleep? Mm -hmm. But this inflammatory process is taking place within the capsule and then gradually it will disappear. Mm -hmm. And as it disappears, the patient develops stiffness in their shoulder. Their shoulder no longer moves anymore. They're unable to elevate their arm. They can't stretch outwards and they find it quite difficult to do these things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it remains quite painful still. The problem is that the condition takes sometimes 18 months to go away. It is off 80, it's a long time. Very so, long. So it can be very self, it can, it's usually self-limiting in fact. If you're patient enough, it will go away. But 18 months, I don't know, for me, that would be a long time. So treatments that, again, that are helpful, a steroid injection mm -hmm. actually into the joint will help people's pain and it will help them sleep better. But it, unfortunately, there's no real evidence to suggest that it alters how long you have the syndrome for. So you may still have a stiff shoulder for 18 months, even after a steroid injection. You might be sleeping a bit better, mm -hmm. but life's a better place if you're sleeping, I guess. True. But if a patient comes in and says, well, my symptoms do not subside, what options do you have? Well, I think the important thing is to get the diagnosis correct and then give the information to the patient. So you can say, well, if you're patient, it will sort of get better with time. And that is sort of observational neglect. And it is a reasonable way forward, but it doesn't always resolve. Mm -hmm. Two other treatments that can be offered would be something called a hydrostatic dilation. Mm -hmm. And that is where, as an outpatient procedure, we'll place a little needle into the shoulder joint and try and dilate the actual joint with local anaesthetic and corticosteroid again. Okay. And the advantage of that is that it is not surgery and it may well help your shoulder to recover over a period of weeks and you may recover some range of motion and it may well help with pain. It doesn't work for everybody but it's yeah. very safe. Is there an ultrasound guide so you stick a needle and absolutely. you introduce... Usually we'll do it under ultrasound, mm. absolutely. Do you give significant amounts of local anaesthetic and steroids? Well, it is a bit sore, mm. admittedly, but yes, we use a fair bit of local anaesthetic and steroid and it is usually tolerated very well. Mm -hmm. And as an outer patient, you don't need any anaesthetic beyond that. Okay. And you go home the same day and you see a physiotherapist and hopefully we regain some movements. I must say, a good litmus test is always, what would I have? And I think that's a reasonable option. And then how soon can they come back and repeat the procedure? Because they might go home, feel fine for four, five, six weeks, and then say, I'm in pain again, in agony. Can you repeat it so well, quickly? Well, you can do. You I can. mean, again, it's a law of, you know, not the diminishing of returns, but trying to decide, is this actually helping somebody? Okay. I usually will do it once and then review the patient after six weeks and see objectively if they've got better or not. If they say, yes, I've got better, often they'll say, I want to carry on and have some more therapy and wait. Sometimes people come back and they say, you know what, it really hasn't helped that much at all. Mm -hmm. um, then you discuss whether you should try it again or option three, which would be surgery. Yeah. Now, again, keyhole surgery, it's a very very effective procedure but it's surgery nonetheless mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. what we do is we actually release the inside of the shoulder so that as day surgery you go home the same day and you've restored all that movement and the pain has gone away. Mm -hmm. um, often the sh shoulder's a bit sore for a few days but when I review them at two weeks generally their shoulder is much much better. And these are unfortunately desperate people that have had it for some time. They are. And you know what I have observed? I have at least now, um, I can't, it comes in my mind, four female patients with, 
who are suffering with the shoulders yeah. for a long time and we have tried a lot of things and I'm very happy you give us the therapeutic options because you know from service to service from NHS hospital to NHS hospital they provide different services and Absolutely. therapeutic options. So it's good to know now that we can refer anywhere Absolutely. that you can send the patient somewhere else. I find with frozen shoulder, the key really is educating the patient and making them yeah. make the decision about their treatment. Sometimes I have individuals that I see that have had it for already one year or, or 18 months and mm -hmm. they go, look, I've, you know, I'm sick to the back teeth with this. What is my best option? I want something, you know, surgery is not foolproof, but I, I haven't had any major problems with people having mm -hmm. redevelopment mm -hmm. of their stiffness in the shoulder. It's usually very, very effective. But obviously you treat your patient, you tailor your treatment to that patient. Right. And what about these locations? Do you see them quite often? Are they quite often frequent? Well, um, the shoulder instability is, mm. or dislocations, is the most common joint in the body to dislocate because it involves, it enjoys such a big range of motion and the anatomy of the shoulder is such that the ball and the socket are inherently unstable, particularly if the rotator cuff doesn't mm. work well. So we tend to see anterior dislocations where the shoulder comes out the front mm -hmm. and I'll see it in in young individuals mostly because they are more active they play more rugby and football and and um, and they can have a traumatic injury to their shoulder where it comes out of joint um, when you dislocate your shoulder it is important obviously the shoulder gets put back into the joint mm -hmm. and, and that usually involves visiting the emergency department but once that is done, as long as there is no associated injury, like a fracture that needs to be treated, then the treatment of the shoulder instability is to mobilise the arm as comfort allows and then consider the options of what is the chance of there being further instability. Mm -hmm. Because we know that if you dislocate your shoulder once, then it significantly increases mm. the chance of it happening again. It's true, that's what happens to the patients. Uh, they have recurrent dislocations. We don't know if it's a mechanical reason, if they Absolutely. do something to cause that, but obviously there is some kind of movements or efforts which possibly cause that. Absolutely. And we don't know if it's the patient's fault or something else going on. It's a very dangerous game to blame mm. on the patient, um, but often it is multifactorial. In mm -hmm. other words, sometimes there is a structural problem within the shoulder, and that's most common when you have a traumatic injury. Okay. But yes, that magical rotator cuff, those four tendons are hugely important in trying to stabilize the shoulder. Mm -hmm. So it is possible also to have particularly young individuals who develop instability, not because there is a structural problem, but because their muscles contract in an abnormal fashion. Mm -hmm. It is much more unusual, but possible. So the most common structural lesion that I will see in the shoulder is that you damage something called the labrum, which acts as a bumper inside the shoulder. Mm -hmm. So illustration 11 shows um, what is a normal shoulder on the left, looking actually at the socket. And in the central um, image, there is a labral tear. And when mm. you dislocate your shoulder, you tear away that little bumper from the edge of the cup. And that is the most common lesion. And when you do have that there, then often you have recurrent episodes of dislocation. Okay. So people come up to clinic and say, my shoulder has been out four, five, six times. Exactly. And uh, to be honest, Every time that you dislocate your shoulder, you are creating potentially more damage to the joint. I had a couple of children with this problem and I thought it was, you know, the activity of the age causing yeah. that. But those people who have recurrent dislocations, I suppose they will end up having surgery. Is there a way to fixate, to make the joint more stable and prevent that? Is there any well, specific treatment? Well, the mainstay of instability treatment should always involve a physiotherapist, physiotherapist. okay, by strengthening, again, the rotator muscles. cuff muscles, those specific muscles that help to centre the humeral head, 
but also to maintain scapular posture and position, mm -hmm. the foundation of the shoulder, often that gives people enough to give them a stable shoulder. But if your shoulder has been out twice, I think that most people will agree, particularly if you have some structural lesion that you can see on your MRI scan, mm -hmm. that actually you'd be better off repairing that. And the vast majority of people with shoulder instability again can have day surgery in the form of a keyhole surgery right. that repairs those soft tissue structures inside the shoulder to give a shoulder more stability Do again. Do you stitch them somehow as Absolutely. well to keep them more stable to hold the joint? We use very strong stitches again, stitch. much like in rotator cuff repair, mm -hmm. but we re-establish the attachment of that mm -hmm. bumper back onto the cup. It is a fantastically effective way of doing it. Again, we used to do this as open surgery, but now most of the time it's possible to do an instability surgery as keyhole surgery. And following discharge from hospital, most of my patients will say, you know what, I didn't really need any painkillers after three or four days, I was pretty comfortable. There is a slow rehabilitation process with regard to getting back to sports, but usually we can get back people back playing their sports by three or four months. All right. At least this is promising, especially for young patients. Yeah, absolutely. Because they want some quality of life. Absolutely. And I think the key to intervene is when the patient says, you know what, I don't really trust my shoulder anymore. I see. Okay. And arthritis? Yes. Is it the most common thing you see at more advanced group A of ages? Um, well, it's not nearly as common as hip and knee arthritis, okay. but I think there probably is a genetic association mm -hmm. with the development of most arthritis. Um, now, I uh, do do shoulder replacement, but generally it is reserved for people in their senior years. Oh, right. And it is, again, a fantastic way of improving people's quality of life. Is it over 60, over 70, a common it range? It very much depends. Depends. Uh, it very much you depends. I have part of my practice involves um, people with sometimes genetic disorders mm. like uh, sickle cell disease All right, or, yes. or conditions that are associated with the development of mm. um, arthritis because of uh, a poor blood supply to part of the shoulder. They will be individuals that I will do shoulder replacement on at a younger age. Because, uh, sorry, oh, sorry, I thought to interrupt no, okay. you. Because I know I worked in a sickle cell clinic at King's College, and most of them had hip replacements at very, very uh, young absolutely. ages. I yeah. didn't know they do shoulders as well. Well, I will again. It's a, it's a it quality of life issue, mm. and um, the shoulder replacement that I will do for a younger individual, particularly if they have uh, avascular necrosis. necrosis. Mm -hmm is actually a slightly different operation. Okay. I tend to use something called a pyrocarbon implant. Mm -hmm. And this is a particular sort of implant that is very kind to native bone and cartilage. All right. So the weak link in a shoulder replacement, perhaps, and the, the worry about revision in the future tends to be the cup, mm -hmm. the glenoid. And the advantage in somebody with avascular necrosis is that there isn't anything really wrong with the glenoid. So historically, we used to do half a joint replacement, mm. half a joint replacement, but used to involve a metal sphere that would articulate with a normal cup. cup. But the problem with that is that cobalt chrome, the metal, is very hard, and eventually it tends to wear out the cartilage and the bone and creates pain again. Even in these young individuals. So if we're able to use pyrolytic carbon, then mm -hmm. it's a lot kinder to the to the cartilage and the glenoid. And generally that the results of that are very, very good because again we want to avoid people having early problems mm -hmm. and the need for a second operation. Do they last for too many years? Well over ten, twenty roughly, or do you <laughs> don't know yet? Well, our hope is that pyrolytic carbon implants will last for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. The reality is that our follow-up at the moment is probably five years, but we've been okay. using pyrocarbon in the human body for 40 years. It's been used in hand surgery oh. for many, many years, and it is also very, very commonly historically used in cardiac surgery as well. I see. Um, so it is, it is a very exciting 
um, solution, I hope, for very young patients with difficult problems. That's very good to know. And it's good to know that we make steps forward Absolutely. all the time. That's the promising thing. Absolutely. There are always advances that are being made. Um, it's important that these are uh, controlled and put in, in the right environment. Um, but yes, it is very exciting. Do you run specific clinics at NHS for all this or is a general orthopedic clinic? Because um, they, your, your patients sound quite exciting and not very common cases. I enjoy my practice and because it is very varied. Um, mm -hmm. But I do sh shoulder, elbow and hand surgery mm -hmm. and uh, I have a specific upper limb practice that pretty much only deals with people with these problems. Even if, exactly, if they're re the problems are related to sickle cell, or vascular necrosis, needs a replacement of the yes. joint, we can refer to a general orthopedic shoulder clinic? Well, I, gen generally speaking, it's mm. referred to, uh, to, mm. to my clinic at the Royal London, mm -hmm. um, and the there is, uh, is um, a tertiary in the NHS. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it's referred to me at London Sports Orthopaedics okay. as a tertiary referral for mm -hmm. consideration for treatment. All right. No, it's good to know because one of the purposes of doing this uh, show is to inform people, to let them know about options they have. Sure, absolutely. We have a lot of Greek citizens yeah. and Cypriots, but Greeks who have invaded the country the last few years <laughs> as financial immigrants, they are used to a completely different, fantastically different system. system. Absolutely. NHS in Greece is completely different. So sometimes they don't know how or where to direct themselves. Absolutely. So I'm trying to explain that there are options and we can direct them yep. either NHS or probably depending on sure. the budget. So we have options, Absolutely. we have new treatments, we have uh, progress doing treatments which we did not know a few yes. years back and maybe they're not provided even in Greece. Well it's all about information yes. and information is very powerful uh, yes. and as, an, as a patient I think the key is to understand what what is available to you and what isn't. Of not course. every treatment is always appropriate but um, knowing what your options are is hugely important no, and I think reassuring you know. for the patient. Exactly, exactly. It's good to know that there more things that could be done. Absolutely. Which one will suit you? The doctor, the specialist will tell you. Anything else you would like to tell us? Because I find it very educative and it was very nice. It ran so smoothly and you told us so many things. I think we covered everything about the shoulder. I think we covered shoulder. what we need to. Yes. And we don't want to be strictly medical so people can no, understand. absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for telling us all about the shoulder. The new treatment, Paracallo. <laughs> you see? Grazie molto. Ah. To be fair, <laughs> Greek, <laughs> Italian, we have to be fair. It was amazing having you, and I ho I'm looking forward to meet the rest of the team because obviously it's good to know that we have hope. We have hope for the better. We move forward, we have options, we have better treatments, and some problems which we didn't know how to deal with when we were accepting them as that's it, you can do anything. Absolutely. Now you can offer us so much more and that's really positive and promising and reassuring. Thank you very much for uh, giving us your time, Thank you for your me. knowledge tonight and your help and support. I hope our viewers will have many answers to their questions and maybe you will see some of them in your clinic soon. Fabulous. Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ που ήσασταν μαζί μας και απόψε. Σας εύχομαι καλή εβδομάδα και ραντεβού την επόμενη Κυριακή. Καληνύχτα.